I have a question for you tonight. It is the title of our lesson. The question is, what is bad? What is bad? Well, Job had something to say about that. He said, what is bad? That thou, art, that thou shouldest magnify him. What is bad that thou shouldest set his thy, thy heart upon him? What is bad that thou should visit him every morning? And over in the 15th chapter of the book of John, Eli, uh, Eliphaz, a friend of his, said, What is bad? That he should be clean. What is bad that which is uh, born of a woman? What is bad that should be righteous? And David said in Psalm chapter 8, he says, talking about uh, from God, or, actually, or speaking to God, he says, What is bad? that thou art mindful to him. And what is bad that you provide for him daily? And over in Psalm 144, he says to the great God I am, he says, what is bad? And what is bad that you take, uh, that, uh, you take knowledge of him? So the question is, what is bad? The answer in the New Testament is found in Ephesians chapter 1, at verse uh, 3 through 18. Actually, those 18 verses, the first verses of that book, tells you that God chose bad. And he ordained bad. And he set rules for bad, regulations and uh, boundaries and borders. And he made bad that he be, be holy. Bad that he be without blemish or blame. Bad that he be full of love. Love for one another, love for God. And he chose bad to be the adopted sons of God. And with the purpose. And he didn't come here randomly, but he had a purpose, a reason for being here. And God then said that I have something for bad, and that is that he have, response, have uh, redemption. And that he have a forgiveness of sins. And that he have salvation around the throne. And those 18 verses of that first chapter of Ephesus says God determined the purpose of man. That man is to be one with God. And one in Christ. And in a dispensation of the fullness and stature of Christ. And that he, man should be heirs of the grace of God. So what is bad? Well, man is here for a reason. And for purpose. Why was he created in the first place? Well, the answer is, of course, verse 6 of chapter 1, the book of Ephesians. It's a simple verse. There are a number of other verses that would tell you this, but this one says that we might be the praise of the glory of his grace. That's his purpose for us. What is bad that thou art mindful of him? That he praise me that he glorifies me, that he keeps me first in his life? The answer is praise, praise, praise God. So from these first 18 verses, we learned that man should set his heart upon God because he is God's creature. God's cre God created him for a purpose, that he should be clean, that he should be righteous, that he should gain knowledge of God, but get it from him and not from himself, and that he should be aware of what God is, who God is, why God exists, and why God, rather, has caused us to exist, and he should be attentive of God in all forms and fashion. As John, 1 John 2, 3 through 6 says, that we keep his commandments, that we keep his word, that we walk in the way in which Jesus walks that God will care for man, that God will supply all of the things for man. He must know that, as Philippians 4, 19 says. And man must say, be able to say, I can do all things through him that strengtheneth me. However, man uh, must give an account of, him, of, his, of himself to his creator, he must uh, write his name in the book of life. And if it's not there, then he has to give an account of all that he's done. 
And so the conclusion of the matter is, the sum of it all is, is what Ecclesiastes 12 and 13 says. It says we're to fear God. We're to respect God. We are to pay homage to Him. Look upon Him with all. In other words, be awful of God. And respect Him as the Holy One and the author of all things. For, as Colossians 1, 16 and 17 says, that all things were made by Jesus for him. And he's over all things. And that in verse 18 says that in all things he might have the preeminence. So man is looking to Christ Jesus as the preeminent one and worships him. So God created all things. And he finished his creation. When he finished his creation, he said to himself at Genesis chapter 1, 26 and 27, he says, Let us make bad, bad, yes, make bad in our image and after our likeness. You mean you're going to make, we want to make God, we want to make bad, not as the animals? Well, we're to have, uh, we're to be breathing animals, like a breathing animal, like all breathing animals. So he made for bad out of the dust of the earth, and he breathed, it, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That's just breathing like all breathing animals. And then he put something else inside. He put himself, for that is something like himself, an image uh, of himself, into man. You say, well, what does he look like? I don't know. I have never seen that image. My father died. My mother was on one side. I was on the other side of him. Uh, my sisters and siblings were, other, were all around, and relatives were all around, and I said, uh, inappropriately probably, but I said, look, my father is going to breathe his last breath. And we know what James says, that when the spirit leaves, he's dead. So when he dies, as he's dying, his spirit will leave him. Now we've heard that some people say they see that spirit from time to time. People say they do see that spirit, leave people. Well, let's see if we could see it. Well, we could not see it. We did not see it. No one has ever seen it. I've never seen mine. You will not see yours. But we're made in the image of God. If we saw God, by the way, we would die. We have uh, bones, but, uh, and we have uh, things like other animals, but we're not like an animal. We're entirely different from an animal and in so many different ways. But John 4, 24 says, God is spirit. He is a spirit. We are a spirit. We have a spirit in us. And God made us like this. He said, Jesus talked about this, Matthew 10, 28. He said, Fear not them that kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather... Fear him which is able to destroy both the soul and the body. So this inner person inside of us is called a soul or, or, or a spirit, uh, whatever you want to call it. It's that person inside of us. And that's the one that will give an account for all that we do in our body. And in John, Acts chapter 17, verse 24, 4 and 5, he tells us that God dwells not and temples made with hands. Temples that we made. This building is a temple or could be a temple or whatever you want to call it. And God does not dwell in the building. The building is not holy. And nor is he worshipped with man's hands. Anything that we can make, we cannot use it to worship God. That is to say, it is not the physical thing itself that is to be worshipped. Because God is not physical and he's made us in a, such a way that we will worship him and not, not from a physical something that we can make. But everything we do, it comes from him. We worship in ways that resemble him. We worship in spirit and we worship in the truth according to as he has given to us. There is a so we ask the question, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And uh, somebody says, uh, I thought that we were saved by grace, and grace is a free gift. 
Why is it you keep talking about things to do? Well, that argument, of course, we're saved by grace as a free gift is uh, from a humanist point of view, a human tradition, human philosophy, and vain deceits because, yes, forgiveness of sins is generously available to every and each human. And he, gave, he gave freedom from sin. You shall know the truth. The truth shall set you free. Whosoever believeth on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. But uh, forgiveness of sin is not free in the sense, in the strictest sense of the word, that it has no restrictions. It has restrictions. Forgiveness of sins is based upon conditional activity on our part because we are to repent first of our sins. And then we are to wash it away by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's a washed in water. It's called baptism in water. And Jesus corrected, directly commanded people that. He said in Acts 2.38, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. After all, reward awaits one who obeys the command. As uh, Hebrews 11.6 says, For one who cometh to God must first believe that he is, and then he must be a rewarder, believe that he is a rewarder of him that, that diligently seek after him. And so we have to seek after him and have to do what he says. Let me show you something. In John 17, 17, Jesus says, talking to the Father in his prayer, sanctify thy word. Thy word is truth. Sanctify it. Purify it. Cleanse it. Make it pure, holy. Jesus prayed to the Father to sanctify his word, and he did it. And that word we have in front of us, it's called our Bible. So we are sanctified, and we're made pure, and we're cleansed by the use of that word. When the word, the purified word says, to wash yourself in water, pure water, as Ephesians 5.26 says, then we are to do it. And Mark 16, 16, Jesus says, He that believeth and is baptized, that's the water baptism, we are cleansed by the word, sanctified by the word, in the washing in water, and that's where we get the blood, because the blood of Jesus was shed for the remission of our sins. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, we are washed from our sins by his blood, and Saul, a fellow from Tarsus, was told to arise and wash away your sins. Yes. How? Because we want the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ washes away our sin. How? He says, by baptism. And we're sanctified by the word which tells us, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. If you haven't done that tonight, this is a good time, the great time the excellent time to do it. And if you're listening and you don't know about this too much, you don't want to know some more, call us and we will come and talk to you about this matter. Do it now while we stand and while we sing.